of uh, today's talk is what is confocal microscopy? Uh, here is a kind of simplified layout of how a confocal microscope works uh, for both photoluminescence and ramen. So I'll go through the, the basic components. So if we start off with the excitation source, which is nearly always a laser. So the laser comes in, it's then uh, reflected off a dichroic mirror and down towards the objective lens. Uh, this focuses the, the beam onto the sample uh, to a point that then excites the sample at that point. And the sample is placed on a microscope stage and this stage is nearly always motorized. So which allows you to move the point that where the laser hits on the surface of the sample. So these microscope stages can be moved in the X, Y, and Z direction, where Z is the up in the vertical uh, axis. This excitation either creates photoluminescence or Raman, depending on what you want to look at, which is then reflected from the sample and collected by the objective lens. So it's a reflection configuration, also known as an epi configuration. And this photoluminescence or Raman then passes up through the dichroic mirror and is then filtered through a rejection filter. So this removes all the uh, ex excitation wavelength that might have got to this point. So the laser wavelength is blocked here. And then the photoluminescence and Raman uh, signal is focused down through a pinhole. So this is the defining feature of a confocal microscope. And it's something I'll be exploring in more detail uh, later in the talk. But for now, just note it's there. Uh, the signal then continues, focused into the entrance slit of the spectrograph. So the spectrograph is used to wavelength select uh, the signal. So the light comes in, it's focused using a mirror onto a grating, a diffraction grating, and this separates the, the, wave, uh, the light into its constituents' wavelengths. This is usually a grating turret. Uh, so in the, I've shown three here, but on our uh, Raman microscopes, there's actually five grating turrets. And if you want to do photoluminescence, for example, you would use a diffraction grating with a low dispersion uh, because you typically have very broad spectra. If you want to do Raman microscopy, you would have a, a high groove density grating uh, to get for the higher resolution that's required uh, to analyze the Raman peaks. So this turret allows you to change the modality of the instrument depending on the resolution and spectral range that you require. The light that's now been separated at its constituents wavelengths then passes on as an image using a mirror onto a CCD camera. So the CCD camera allows you to acquire the full spectrum in a single shot. And for both photoluminescence and Raman, for steady state measurements, you would use the CCD camera. I've also drawn here a second detector and are explaining this in more depth for the talk, but the RMS-1000, it can also function as a photoluminescence lifetime uh, microscope. So there's now a, a single point detector, a photomultiply tube to measure photoluminescence lifetimes. So instead of imaging onto the CCD, the light can be directed through a slit and onto the PMT for lifetime measurements. I hope that gives you a brief uh, overview of how these instruments work because I'll be referring to this, the various parts of this throughout the rest of the talk. And what these look like in practice, this is our RM5 Raman microscope and this is the RMS1000, its big brother. So both of these are confocal Raman microscopes and the main difference is that the RMS-1000 is a more modular instrument. You can couple external lasers into it. And it's also larger because you can add uh, a longer focal length spectrograph for higher resolution. And for this talk, what's also important is that it's designed to be a Raman and photoluminescence microscope. The RM5 can do some photoluminescence, but for photoluminescence lifetime and true photoluminescence spectra, it's the RMS-1000. And all the measurements that I'm going to show throughout this uh, webinar are based around the RMS-1000.
That brings me on to the first application section of today's talk, which is looking at 2D materials. The most famous 2D material is by far graphene, and I'm sure everybody in this webinar is familiar with the material. Uh, graphene has excellent electronic, thermal, and structural properties, which make it a very promising material to incorporate into semiconductor and electronic devices. And Raman uh, microscopy has established itself as one of the optimum ways in order to investigate the electronic properties of graphene. And it's those electronic properties that are useful for its end user applications. And they can be fine tuned and adjusted and investigated using Raman. And in fact, it's something like 30% of confocal Raman microscope papers uh, published last year were published uh, on graphene. It's by far the biggest application. So why is Raman so good at analyzing graphene? So the, the key point is that the bands observed in the Raman spectrum, which correspond to the phonon modes, are directly related to the electronic structure of the graphene. So if we consider a pristine monolayer of graphene, so a hexagonal lattice of carbon atoms, it has two defining Raman bands. We've got the G band at 1580 wave numbers and the 2D band at 2680. However, creating graphene that is perfect, as shown here, is very difficult. And generally, there's always going to be some amount of defects in the structure. And controlling these defects is very important for electronic applications as they're going to change the electronic properties of the graphene. So examples of defects are dislocations in the lattice or simply where the lattice ends uh, also counts as a defect. And when these defects are present in the graphene lattice, an additional Raman band becomes active, the D band, at 1350 wave numbers. So Raman uh, microscopy can be used to image the location and the density of defects within your sample. An example of this is shown here. So on the left here is a white light image of the graphene surface. So this is a reflected bright field image where the graphene surface has been imaged using a white light illumination source, so traditional microscopy. And then that image captures in a camera. And you can see that on the white light image, the graphene is very featureless. It's almost impossible to characterize graphene uh, using traditional optical microscopy. However, if we then compare the same sample, but now we're doing a Raman image, you can see you contain much more information. So what this image on the right is, is that the microscope is scanned across the surface uh, of this graphene layer, and the intensity of the 1350 peak is integrated. So the, that corresponds to the defects. So on this color plot here, where we have a dark background, that means there's very low defect density. We have kind of perfect pristine graphene. And where the bright regions are has a high 1350 peak, indicating that defects are present here. So this demonstrates how confocal Raman microscopy can be used to image the location of the defects. And from this information, you can determine, is this defect density suitable for your application? Or do you need to refine your synthesis procedure in order to optimize this defect distribution? Another example of where uh, Raman microscopy can be used in graphene is determining the number of layers. So in the strictest sense, graphene only refers to a single monolayer. However, it's quite difficult to make monolayer graphene. And typically, you can end up with multi-layer graphene. And generally, up to about five layers is still considered graphene. And But this is important because the electronic properties change depending on if you've got monolayer or multi-layer graphene. And run microscopy can be used to distinguish between these two regimes. So with monolayer graphene, you've typically got the scenario where the G-band compared to the D uh, 2D-band, 
uh, is at least a ratio of two. So if the 2D band is twice as high as the G band, this is a good indication that you've got monolayer graphene present. If this ratio, if when you move to multi-layer graphene, the G band intensity increases because you now have more layers in the graphene and the 2D band decreases because and broadens out as it splits into multiple peaks. So this ratio then becomes lower than two and typically the G band becomes much higher than the 2D. So using this information, you can determine whether you've got monolayer or multilayer graphene and whether that needs to be adjusted in your synthesis procedure depending on which type of graphene you want. And like the previous example, you could also map across the surface of the graphene and monitor which regions are monolayer and which are multilayer. Moving away from graphene onto a, another 2D material. So this one is transition metal dichalcogenide monolayers or TMD monolayers for short. And these are a very hot topic at the moment as they're considered kind of next generation graphene. So a structure of these is shown on the right. So the idea is you've got a transition metal, typically the molybdenum or tungsten uh, with a chalcogen such as sulfur, selenium, or tellurium, and they give this MX2 uh, structure. So it's basically like an inorganic analog of graphene. And the reason that these are such a hot topic is that despite graphene's excellent uh, electronic properties, one of its main downsides is that it has no band gap. And for semiconductor applications, you require a band gap such as to make a transistor. So graphene in its pure form acts as a metal, and there have been some investigations uh, and work put into trying to create a band gap in graphene. For example, you can oxidize it to make graphene oxide, but generally the band gaps are very small and you've got limited control. And the, the kind of hot topic about transition metal dichogenides as that in a monolayer, these are direct band gap semiconductors and therefore can be integrated into semiconductor electronics. And like graphene, they can be imaged using confocal Raman and also for these now confocal photoluminescence microscopy. And shown here is a, a Raman image of isolated uh, molybdenum sulfide monolayer triangles, which are now explained in more detail. So what does the ram and molybdenum sulfide look like? So the Raman spectrum is shown here on the right, and molybdenum sulfide has a fairly simple Raman spectrum, at least in the fingerprint region. It consists of two main bands, one about 382 uh, wave numbers and 405 wave numbers. And these correspond to two different phonon modes uh, in the hexagonal uh, molybdenum sulfide lattice. And if we integrate the intensity of these phonon modes and scan across the surface of the sample, you can then generate this uh, Raman intensity profile, which images the molybdenum sulfide uh, nanoflake. And you can see it has this triangular structure that uh, many of the transition metal dichogenides uh, tend to adopt. Looking at this more closely, we can see that the intensity in the surrounding region is mostly constant, but at the center, there's this bright spot. And if you look at the scale here, this corresponds to stronger RAM and scattering intensity in the center. And this is a good indication that we may have monolayer uh, molybdenum sulfide on the outside and multilayer molybdenum sulfide, which scatters more strongly in the center. And you can see I've marked these points one and two, and that corresponds to one and two uh, on the spectrum on the right. And if we look at the, the separation between the peaks, the fingerprint region here uh, and the Raman can be used to distinguish between monolayer and multilayer molybdenum sulfide. So monolayer typically has a narrower separation between the two peaks, and as we move uh, to region two, you can see the separation increases from 17 to 21 wave numbers.
So the combination of the higher scattering intensity at the center and also this separation of the peaks suggests that there's a multi-layer defect in the middle of this molybdenum sulfide nanoflake. If this is true, we should also be able to see the same thing by using photoluminescence microscopy. So here is the same image, uh, the same molybdenum sulfide nanoflake, but now it's been imaged uh, using photoluminescence. So the, the experimental configuration is very similar. It's the same sample, the same laser, the same power, but the main difference is that the diffraction grating inside the RMS 1000 has now been changed from a high groove density grating, so 1800 grooves per millimeter down to 300 grooves per millimeter. And this allows you to cover a much broader range uh, to capture the photoluminescence. So looking at this, these spikes on the left are the ramen that we were looking at on the last slide. So molybdenum sulfide peaks are about here, and there's also some spikes uh, due to this being on a silicon substrate, which has its own Raman spectrum. And then this broad feature is the photoluminescence of the molybdenum sulfide. And this image on the, the left here is the integrated intensity of this photoluminescence spectrum. So you can see it shows the same general shape, but the interesting part is that it shows the opposite intensity profile to the Raman. The Raman had a bright point in the center, whereas the photoluminescence is bright around the sides and has a, an intensity dip in the center. And this is confirms what we suspected from the Raman data, that there's multi-layer molybdenum sulfide present, as the photoluminescence quantum yield of molybdenum sulfide is typically much higher in the monolayer state than in multilayer, because as you move from monolayer molybdenum sulfide to multilayer, you change from a direct band gap semiconductor to an indirect band gap. And when you move to indirect band gaps, your photoluminescence quantum yield decreases. And you can see this intensity dip as a result. So this is a good example of how Raman and photoluminescence can both be applied to the same material to give complementary information. And with the combination of the two measurements, you can confirm what is happening at a structural level. You can also extend this to a much wider area. So this is still molybdenum sulfide, but we're now looking at a continuous film of molybdenum sulfide deposited using chemical vapor deposition. And this is a Raman intensity map. And you can see that the Raman can be used to analyze the quality of your molybdenum sulfide or transition metal dichogenide film. So you can see there's bright spots here, which suggests that there may be multi-layer molybdenum sulfide present. And you can also clearly see the grain boundaries. Uh, and so you get an indication of how good uh, your molybdenum sulfide film is and whether you need to improve your deposition procedure to get a higher quality film or not. And as I was saying, 2D materials in general are a very important application area of Raman. Uh, that's all I'm going to talk about them today, but next year we'll be doing a webinar solely dedicated to analyzing these 2D materials using photoluminescence and Raman in more detail.